Hi everyone, welcome to my channel Anarchy for Freedom India and our channel Awaken India Movement. Today I'm joined by scientist uh, Kevin McKernan who I've been following on Twitter for quite some time and I think uh, he's one of the best people who can give us uh, great perspectives with respect to you know the PCR and the scientific fraud surrounding the PCR because he's actually he was involved in the uh, refutation of the common Rostin uh, paper that was initially published, which actually drove a lot of the you know PCR use around the world. And he was involved in the paper along with uh, you know Dr. Mike Eden and others in uh, you know show, highlighting the problems with the original uh, you know PCR assays that were used. So Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. You're primarily going to be interacting with an Indian audience, so I, I think this is the first for you. Uh, can Excellent. you introduce yes. yourself for the audience and just let people know like a uh, little bit about your background? Sure. So um, I got involved in genomics back in 1996. Uh, I was running the um, research and development team at MIT for the Human Genome Project under um, Eric Lander. Uh, Eric Lander, you may know, is now a scientific advisor for President Biden. Um, after the Human Genome Project, I rolled a bunch of the IP into a few startup companies in the genomic space. One was called Agincorp. Um, uh, biosciences that, that built a lot of DNA purification tools that Beckman Coulter eventually acquired. We also spun out a company that built a DNA sequencer um, called the Solid Sequencer. Um, I worked with LifeTech on that one uh, for well, probably five years or so. So very familiar with PCR. All of these tools relied on PCR. Um, and currently I'm, my role is at a company called Medicinal Genomics. We, uh, we've, we've been focusing primarily on building PCR assays to pick up plant viruses and plant pathogens in the cannabis space. Uh, so I'm very familiar with performing PCR and using it clinically. I've also run a CLIA lab, which is a clinical sequencing laboratory here in the States, uh, mostly for next generation sequencing and PCR. So um, I'm familiar with the regulations in the space and familiar with a lot of the, the controls and the details that are required to do this clinically. And that's great because uh, since you since you're involved in genomics and actually like next generation uh, next generation sequencing and stuff, it'll be great if later on in the podcast we can go into this, this whole uh, idea that some some people in the health freedom movement have that uh, you know sequencing is a fraud and it's just making up uh, nucleotide spaces. And I, I don't okay. know if you've come across these arguments or not. But a lot I of people say the virus don't exist and uh, it's just like something that's made up. So yeah, I think I, okay, we can touch on that. Yeah. Sure. So uh, just to start out with, uh, could you just explain, I mean, I know it's hard for you to explain in simple terms because of your background, but if you can just lay out exactly how the PCR works and then we can go into some of your critiques of uh, the common drops in the report that, you, that was published earlier. Uh, sure. So, so PCR requires at least two different sequences for you to amplify DNA. Uh, these are called primers. Um, and these things have to be designed according to your target. Uh, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, many of the PCR assays were designed off of SARS-CoV-1. They used that sequence as a, as a guide to design primers that would hopefully amplify SARS-CoV-2. So some of the earlier primer sets, like the corman drosten ones, were actually designed off the wrong virus. Um, those primer sequences, usually about 20 letters long, will guide these primers to hybridize the pieces of DNA that they want to amplify, and they'll act as bookends, if you will. They will border the regions that they want to amplify. So if your primers land on DNA, uh, the polymerases will then extend and copy DNA over and over again between where those two primers sit. Um, so they won't amplify DNA outside the primers, they'll only amplify in the region where the primers land. Um, so it's important that those primers are very um, specific to the target that you're amplifying, otherwise they'll amplify other things. It's important that they don't have mismatches in them, otherwise they can amplify other things. And it's very important that the two primers themselves don't interact with each other, otherwise they amplify themselves and not the target. Um, so that is what has gone on in some of the very, very early PCR primer protocols that are out there. Um, I think a lot of this has been addressed with newer protocols that have emerged ever since then, but it's not very clear to me where these protocols are all being run in which jurisdictions. That's hard to track. There's hundreds of these PCR primers uh, that are out on the marketplace, uh, and not all of them have been through very careful review. Now, when you're performing PCR, uh, you're amplifying single molecules usually up to millions of molecules in the process of amplification. And we try to track that amplification process with some type of fluorescent signal. Um, some people can use intercalating dyes that will just decorate any DNA non-specifically and give you signal. They're not as specific as using what's known as quantitative PCR. Most of the market is using quantitative PCR, which uses a third piece of DNA that sits between the two primers. And when the amplification goes off, the primers run into that probe and digest it and liberate two molecules on that probe. One's a quencher and one's a fluorophore. And when they're together on the same piece of DNA, there's no signal, 
And when the primers run into it and, and obliterate it, you then liberate this quencher from the fluorophore and you get signal. So you get a fluorescent signal that goes up in time as the amplification um, increases. Uh, so most of the market is on that type of quantitative PCR that's known as TACMAN. And it's called a five prime endonuclease assay uh, because it actually, when it runs into that probe, the endonuclease activity actually breaks apart the probe and, and gives you some signal. Uh, so uh, where did this go off the rails? Um, I think the most important thing in quantitating viruses is to get a viral load. You need to know how much virus is there relative to something. Uh, and a lot of the tests aren't doing that second step. They're just measuring how much PCR signal they get, but they don't have an internal control to measure how much human sample did you get in the collection process. So the, the swabs that you put up people's nose, those are known to vary by a thousand to 10,000 fold in the amount of RNA or DNA they capture from the human. Uh, if you don't measure how much you're getting in the sampling process, it's hard to make sense of your viral load because you effectively just have an RNA number, but you don't know how many cells it derived from. So you will see a lot of information in the literature that talks about viral load when they don't actually have it. They don't have two signals and you need to at least those two signals to, to, to quantitate a viral load. That's probably the main issue, I think, with the corman drosten primer set is they have no internal controls and therefore they kind of cascaded this PCR market with really sloppy CT guidance. No one knows what to really call a patient as to whether they're infectious or not. Okay, let, let me just uh, walk viewers through, like, uh, I'll just break down what you said in, in a kind of a little bit more simplistic fashion, and you can correct me when I'm wrong. Sure. So what we're doing with the PCR is we're trying to take someone's, uh, you know, genetic material from the throat, you know, there we mainly find DNA, uh, RNA, so we basically convert that into DNA via reverse transcriptase enzyme, yes. and then the PCR machine via the primers is actually trying to look for the target of the virus that you're trying to find in the person. That's right. Yes. That's so what, right. what would be the specific role of the probe, if, if you can just elaborate on that a little bit more? Because the primers are trying to target the, the sequence, but like, how does the probe come into that? The probe sits between the, so if you have two primers, they'll put a probe right in the middle so that when the amplification occurs, these polymerases have a, have a five to three endonuclease activity. So when they're extending a piece of DNA, if they run into a probe, it'll basically obliterate that probe. And what that does in the process of destroying that probe is it covalently decouples a fluorophore from a quencher. And then the fluorophore can actually produce fluorescence. When so when the, the probe actually like hits the target, you get this fluorescence signal which, which they yes. detect uh, as and a it, positive result, right? Exactly. And the probe also gives you a little bit more sequence confirmation because it also has like 25 bases of sequence. So it's more specific than the prior method of cyber green, where you amplify and you decorate the DNA with a non-specific dye. The problem with cyber green is your primers could go amplify the wrong target and you wouldn't know it. TACMAN, when you see the signal, you know the signal's derived from a third data point, and that's more reassuring. So it's more of an insurance, further insurance yes. policy, right? Yeah, it's, it's much more specific. Yeah, so I'll tell you how I got into this. Basically, since the, since the pandemic started, I was trying to you know get a proper scientific view of the PCR because there's very very little uh, you know scientific debate happening about the PCR. And I actually happened to stumble across Stephen Boston, who I, I mean, okay. like, we we'll probably talk about him later when we talk about Common Drosten. But I was watching uh, you know his podcast and he laid out the the problems. I mean, if you listen to his interview last year, he really went into the problems of the PCR in detail. I mean, like all the way from the inefficiencies in converting the RNA to DNA to the cycle efficiency of the CT. And I mean, like he, he really <laughs> obliterated the test early on and I mean, set a very high standard and spoke about the Mikey guidelines and how they should be implemented. And this wasn't a time when like a lot of this stuff was out. I mean, in terms of the, I don't think the common Rawson report was out back then. He was just like scientifically, uh, you know, showing the problems of the PCR and how there's a lot of, uh, standardization that needs to happen in order for the results to, to be accurate. So right. that was my entry. And I mean, like watching Stefan Boston now with, uh, you know, like, I mean, I was following your Twitter a little bit. And I, I think he was part of the reviewers who actually uh, dismissed your paper. On, on he was, the, yes. Uh, um, I mean, that's according to what he's said. I, I've got only, the only confirmation I have is actually from, from his, uh, he was on a podcast called Planet Waves that went through this. Now, um, I have also noticed that he and he does have really good Mikey guidelines. I respect all the work he's done in the Mikey guidelines. Those those are all very um, uh, respectable guidelines to be following PCR. Uh, 
his position may have changed throughout the course of the pandemic because he got involved in a startup that's going yeah. after C19 PCR. And so I, I saw him also shift from being, hey, watch out, there are all these pitfalls into everyone has to be doing this. Uh, and uh, I, I may have something to do with his, his more recently obtained conflicts. But um, but yeah, so his uh, th there is some um, description of this actually on, a, on my Twitter handle that describes what we what we put forward in the Corman Drosten review. So what is the Corman Drosten review? Um, we couldn't get the journal to give us the peer reviews of that paper. It, it went through Euro surveillance in record time, and it was such a critical protocol that was on the WHO before it was even peer reviewed that we started asking for the peer reviews and they wouldn't provide them. So we wrote our own. Um, we didn't put them through peer review. We just put them public and let anyone comment on them. Um, and that's not uncommon when you're involved in um, peer review when you submit your comments to a journal regarding a paper, they don't put the peer reviewers comments through another round of peer review. It's just, you, you put your comments out and there's usually three or four reviewers and you, you, you learn from what the three or four people say. So we decided to do the same thing and put all of our comments public. Uh, I'd say it's more exhaustive than your average peer review just because of the severity of the claims. You know, we're making some pretty bold claims against a PCR protocol used to drive a pandemic. We better not walk in here with just a, a you know, a, a Twitter snide comment. And so we, we wrote a good 20 pages initially uh, when people were, um, I guess, complaining that that wasn't enough. We wrote another 60 pages in addendum. And I think the addendum is actually probably more valuable because it actually goes through step by step every paper. There's 20 papers in there. Uh, that demonstrate the problems that uh, that you can run into with those primers. Um, and the, the authors themselves admit there were mistakes. Uh, the, there's one primer set in the paper they suggest you don't even use. So, um, And they're, they're well aware there's actually been some activity on the journal of another individual who complained about the primers having some mismatches in the primer sets. And that's actually now on Euro Surveillance's website admitting that there are problems with some of these primers. Uh, we dove into the third set of primers there and really highlighted the fact that the primers interact with one another, particularly the probe, and its, it's probe itself forms a hairpin, and that's never a good sign. Um, so there's all types of problems with those primers. Now, the interesting thing about our complaints on the corman Drosten review is they very much mimic the complaints that Stephen Buston raised against Andrew Wakefield in the MMR trial. All right. Before we go there, I think uh, some people in the audience probably don't know what the corman Drosten review is, so I'll just, uh, you know, let, let people know a little bit about that. Basically, I mean, uh, as far as I understand it correctly, the scientists in Germany came up with a paper that that went on to be the foundation for a lot of uh, a lot of what the countries around the world would use as their uh, PCR assays, if I'm not mistaken. And it actually passed peer review in just 24 hours, which is like almost never happens, right? Like usually it's about a couple of months or a couple of weeks, yeah, the, but this happened in 24 hours, right? The average for that journal was over 100 days. Uh, okay. and, and, yeah, and Kevin mostly. was part of the basically uh, Kevin was part of the team that actually critiqued that paper that uh, became the basis for a lot of the PCR tests that are used around the world, and uh, he's now highlighting the issues with that. So I, just before you start with the issues in, in the common Rawson review, I'll let you know a little bit about uh, what we've been up to in India. So actually, my friend and I really drove into the PCR, uh, you know, just the whole aspect of. Is it really picking up SARS-CoV-2 and what are the issues, you know, like, uh, is it really detecting infectivity properly? So we ourselves through our own study came up with, uh, you know, a couple of critiques. I actually came across your paper back then as well when I was kind of, you know, drafting my own. And the only reason I left it out is because uh, we didn't want to totally thrash the PCR because we were going to do a court case and we wanted to give the state something to like, you know, use. If, if they like, you know, we didn't want them to kick it out totally. We wanted right. like to let them use something. And if we just, uh, I think if we included your paper, then a lot of doubt about the uh, targets itself that were used and if they were cross reacting and stuff. But the main problems we found, you know, just leaving your side of the paper out was that the PCR doesn't really correlate, uh, you know, properly with virus culture. Like it doesn't correlate right. with infectivity very well at different CTs. And uh, you know you can pick up like a an infect uh, like a fragment of the virus much after the infection has actually That's happened. Right. So we based our main argument on these three things, and we asked the you know government to implement the Mikey guidelines and stuff. But yeah, I mean like other than that, like a lot of the issues that you've highlighted are very very critical because I mean uh, you know your paper basically makes the assertion that the primers are reacting with the water and the primers are cross reacting with themselves, and the primers could even like uh, latch on to other coronaviruses. So which is like 
of critical importance to practically with the lockdown situation and everything. Yeah. So maybe if you could just expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, actually, I think the point you raised up is a more pressing one. Uh, we did highlight that in the Drawson review as well, which is they never correlated this with viral C, with viral PFUs, and they should have done that um, so that they could guide people on what CQ might be indicative of um, viability. Uh, so that, I think that's actually the, the bigger issue in the PCR field is no one's using viability PCR. And there are techniques that are known that can do that. Um, some use RNases, some use, they target subgenomic DNAs. There's, there, there's a handful of ways to get capsid specific PCR. So you're only getting live virus. Um, but okay, I, so what, what you're saying is they don't necessarily need to use culture testing because I mean, I, I delved into the entire culture debate as well. And I saw a couple of papers which are saying that oh, we can't, like uh, use a virus culture test because we risk uh, basically like multiplying no. them and letting them release into this. So you're saying that we can no, no, use PCR no. to actually measure quantitative infectious viruses. No, I, I think you should calibrate it against culture initially, uh, but you, sh you can't run that full scale. You'll just infect all your lab staff. So yeah. um, it, it's, but, but it'd be good to calibrate your tests to know like, like DDA Riolt's lab did this in Rita Jafar's paper. They they went and looked at what CTs yeah. correlated with which PFUs, and and that's that's important to calibrate your test to. But there are other tests out there that take advantage of the fact that packaged virus is protected by a protein coat, and so you can play games with that by using nucleases that destroy anything that's not encapsulated, and then measure only the RNA that's encapsulated after you lyse open the capsid. Um, that is, uh, and then calibrate that to a standard curve that shows how much of it's infectious. And there's people that have published on this. It's just, I, I think there's, um, the financial motivation isn't there in the testing field to do that because right now the real issue is that you're infectious for seven days, but you're PCR positive for like five weeks. Hmm. Okay. So that means you're getting, you know, you would reduce your testing revenues substantially by four fifths. If you only, if you sharpen the needle, and only get the infectious. Now you might think no one's that nefarious, but you have to remember the four fifths of the people that are not infectious, you are getting their contact tracing often. The, so that your testing is an exponent there. For everyone you drag in that's non-infectious, you get maybe three or four other tests, maybe in India it's more due to the family size or how densely settled they are, but that sweeps in you know, a, another, could be five or 10 more tests. So if, if they were to actually narrow the test to only grab those people that were truly infectious, because there are ways to do that with PCR, uh, they would effectively lose an order of magnitude of revenue. Um, so I, I don't think it's gonna happen because they're, they're financially motivated for false positives in this regard. And when I say false positive, I don't mean the test is picking up influenza. I mean, it's, it's properly picking up, it's a clinical false positive. It's properly picking up coronavirus, but it's picking up dead coronavirus. Uh, where it's uh, it's no longer infectious. It's it's a, a long tail of, of sort of RNA decaying out of your system. Yeah, I, I've seen a, I've seen a lot of so-called fact checks saying that oh, PCR can't give false positives because I mean I think they missed the point because what we're saying when we mean a false positive, like you rightly said, is that they're misinterpreting the results of the test. Like you're just finding right. pieces of the virus. You're not really checking the infectivity, which is what we need if we want to quarantine someone. Right. Exactly. That that's it's a critical thing, and the reason I I am uh, really adamant about this is that we're calling these things medical cases off of a single test, okay? That when you when you start talking about this in terms of a medical case, you cannot falsely quarantine somebody on that test. Uh, and that it starts violating all types of medical ethics. So if there were a doctor involved looking at this data and maybe comparing it to other data they had to make a call as to whether you're infectious or not, maybe look at your symptoms or temperature or whatever, then that's, a, that's like a realistic medical case and I could get behind that. But we're blindly calling medical cases off of un, un, uncalibrated tests. When you do that, you have to hold that test to a higher standard, which is you cannot be, be calling um, clinical false positives, calling someone who infectious when they're not. There's no- what, What's your view on testing asymptomatics? Like uh, even if they're uh, infectious, yeah, exactly. like if, let's say if someone's infect, uh, asymptomatic and you do the PCR the way you want it done with the way that it can actually pick up an infectious virus. Would you think there's a need to quarantine an asymptomatic person if you no. actually detect like a like an infectious virus in them? Not no, the PCR, this, but I mean like the way you want it. Yeah, uh, even off a single time point PCR, you, you don't have enough information to know. You, you need an internal control to know the viral load, which they're not doing in most cases. And ideally, you would test them twice, two days, you know, a couple of days apart. If the viral load's going up, okay, I, I can understand you might be infectious. If it's going down, your your viral load is you're probably on the backside of the disease. So, I mean, even if you had the uh, viral, this, this type of uh, viability PCR in place, I think you want more data than just PCR. 
to call a clinical case. I think you, you want to say, what are their symptoms? If they have no symptoms, like you said, well, then you just, you could have a contamination from the laboratory, right? There's, there's, a, there's a variety of things that come into play. And I think my, my question is more geared to the fact that if, can someone actually have infectious virus present in them if they're asymptomatic? Well, that is a good question. I've seen a lot of debate on asymptomatic spread. And um, it's very it's very rare from the studies I've read. There's a JAMA article that puts it down at 0.7% of indoor transmission being, being asymptomatic. There is a, a paper from China where PCR methods weren't very transparent, but they, they measured 10 million people and couldn't find it. Um, so and then, 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 you, then you come into this Delta variant, right? They're claiming that the Delta variant, if you have the vaccine, you are asymptomatic, but you still have high viral load and can spread it. I, I don't, yeah. that's me, uh, I'm like, okay, that seems counter to everything we know about the last variant, but yeah. that's your case and you claim that you now are creating more asymptomatic transmission, maybe you shouldn't be doing this. Um, but I, I, can't, I can't sort out their matrix of lies, uh, so I, I don't really wanna comment on Delta variant and whether or not it has more asymptomatic transmission or not, because I've just not seen you know, well-documented studies that, that conclude that. I have seen studies that imply it has the same CT, whether you're vaccinated mm. or vaccinated. Yeah. And that to me is a sign that the vaccine isn't very effective at suppressing the evolution of the virus, which is frightening. But um, uh, so I would lean on asymptomatic transmission still being extraordinarily rare. Uh, I think it's the symptoms that actually drive a lot of the droplets in the aerosols and uh, the exhalation of the virus. So. Um, I, I wouldn't want to, it's ne they've never been the driver of respiratory viruses. And Fauci himself is on record saying that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, like our views align totally on that because even when we wrote our like paper and the demands for the government and stuff, we were basically telling them like stop testing asymptomatics totally and that will itself cut out like 80 or 90% of your total cases. And then for whatever remaining symptom the uh, people you want to test, then we can talk about how the PCR should be done, etc. So other yeah. than this whole infectivity problem about with the CT and, you know, testing positive later after infection, can you go into some of the other things that you highlighted in your paper, uh, primarily that the primers, some of the primers are interacting with water. And I think you said that some of the targets that they were using, like the e-gene and the, I think the RDRP target as well, that the primers were interacting with themselves. Is that correct? That's correct. So, um, yeah, and, and the other, the other, just to finish off that last comment, I think rapid antigen tests are, are a useful tool in this whole discussion as well. They're, they really only capture people that are that are infectious. But in terms of the Drosten um, uh, critiques, yes, we, we had concerns over there being mismatches in some of the primers. In fact, those are replicated by another group, and that that is now decorated on the uh, on the paper at Eurosurveillance. They've admitted to that. So there are mistakes in some of the primers where the nucleotide sequences in the primers actually match SARS one more than they match SARS two. So you have to worry about those primers potentially picking up other coronaviruses. Um, there are problems with uh, both of the other assays that you mentioned. Uh, one of them forms a hairpin uh, where the actual probe itself folds on itself. Uh, and that can create all types of artifacts in, in quantitative PCR. Um, there are a couple of papers that are listed there that demonstrate this where people have run these assays under different conditions and they've gone and sang or sequenced the products and they can see that the products are off target. Uh, they're not actually amplifying the, the, correct, um, uh, the, the, the correct sequences. Now, um, there's another individual who's done some work on this since then. Um, Sing Lee, I think, has published a paper where he's been using nested PCR and Sanger sequencing to quantitate how frequently some of these PCR products are actually capturing coronavirus versus other viruses. Um, and there's, he's finding off target events quite a bit. So, um, I think the important thing to get across to people on the fidelity of these things is oftentimes you will hear people say, well, we sequence validate everything we're doing, therefore there aren't any false positives. Hmm. That's a bit of a sleight of hand. They're really not sequence validating everything. They're sequence validating things that have a CT less than 32 usually. And I don't think there's a lot of contest and controversy over the CTs less than 32. I think the tests are doing a pretty good job there. Uh, I would prefer they all have internal controls. Drosten doesn't have that, and I think that assay should just be off the market. But um, the CDC primers here in the States do have these internal controls, and I think that's very important for monitoring the variation you get when you're swabbing your nose. But it's the CTs after 32, which is where I think all the mess starts to happen. And they're not sequence validating those for us to know. Um, in fact, the CDC here in the States moved the sequencing threshold down to 28 for any breakthrough case of the vaccine. So there, yeah. there even, there's more stringency of whether, when you've been vaccinated. Um, 
So the stuff above 32, what is that? How do we know that material is on target if you can't sequence validate it? It's, I would almost argue you shouldn't run any clinical test that you can't sequence validate. Uh, so if, if you can't get CT, if you can't sequence at a certain CT, don't call people at those CTs because you can't confirm that you have accuracy there. Um, so, uh, wait, when you when you say sequence, you mean that uh, they're actually like doing whole genome sequencing on, on the test results that they're finding? They do. They graduate a certain percentage, at least here in the States, a certain percent, not all of the samples, but they take a subselection of some of the samples that are under a CT of 32 and they sequence them. And they usually are using um, an Arctic protocol or something that does whole genome sequencing on Illumina across the virus. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's really helpful because you can look for um, if the you know variants and, and and catalog if there's any VOCs coming through these variants of concern and if there's anything that might be one of the primers may have missed. I, I mean, if I were in their labs, I'd be running all the ones that have primer dropouts. Like you usually, you have three targets, and if one of them doesn't show up and the other two do, that's a sign that you probably have variants under the other primer set that you want to watch for. That happened to the spike gene um, in the TAC path assay in the UK. When the B1117 variant came through, it created an S gene target failure, and one of their assays just dropped off the map. And then, then they're running the whole population on two assays, which meant they had a higher rate of positivity. If you if you only require two out of the three yeah. to go off, you get 20% more hits. Um, so you have to keep an eye on that. I, I, you'll see some of the newer tests coming out. There's one out from Thermo that just went through um, an FDA approval. And they're now targeting eight different amplicons to deal with the fact that there's so many variants now that if you just run this on three, you're bound to have some drop out due to all the variants that are in play. Uh, so the Drosten protocol really only had one functional assay. And you'll see through our paper that even that assay throughout the literature is having problems. It has really low sensitivity. So I think it has high false negatives on top of it also having some false positives because some people were reporting it was lighting up in their negative controls. Uh, which is a sign that the primers are, are doing gymnastics on themselves and creating false signals. Yeah. So how would we practically go about applying this? Because the common uh, Drosten protocol was like published a uh, long time back. And uh, do you think that the assays and the targets have actually changed since then? Like, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, if I do a PCR in India right now, I get a report and they tell me that they're targeting the RDRP area and the E gene and you know, like things like that. So. Practically, I mean, if you're saying that the RDRP uh, primers that were used in the common Rosson report, the primers were interacting with themselves, meaning that they weren't actually landing on the virus target. They were landing on themselves and like act exponentially multiplying themselves, right? Yeah, so there, there, there's a couple things that can be going on when your primers are promiscuous like this. Um, they could be landing on themselves. They could be landing on some background that's either present in your water. Not all water is 100% pure. You oftentimes get some background E. coli DNA. I mean, nothing mm -hmm. grows in the water, but they sterilize, and that sterilization process doesn't rid the DNA. So okay. there's sometimes things in water samples that can trigger the primers. People have shown that some of these primers will attach to aspergillus. They attach. To, they have some homology to human DNA. Um, I've not seen evidence that they land in close proximity to create an amplicon, but that's enough for a primer to maybe land on foreign DNA, extend 10 or 15 bases, fall off, and then, you know, and then, it, and then perform, get, per, create some type of primer dimer now that you, you, your, your three prime ends of these primers have, have partially mm -hmm. extended. So uh, it's not clear, I think, on all the different ways that these primers are interacting. All we do know is that in, in silica, if you run primer dimer screens on them, you can find primer dimers amongst the primer sets, uh, particularly between, I think, the E gene and the RDRP gene. And these are never multiplexed in the same well. They shouldn't be. But liquid handling robots might contaminate primers uh, in between, and you can get primer dimers that way. Um, one of them forms this hairpin on the probe, which can be a problem. So th these are all. Um, critiques that were levied to get that Stephen Buston used to attack Wakefield. And it was, you know, fine to use that to condemn him, but now they're in place in a global pandemic and people aren't saying anything. Now what's going on in India? I don't know if you're using the same primer. So I don't want to, I don't want to create a bunch of panic out there because these are, there's hundreds of primer sets out there. And while they're labeled RDRP, that means they're targeting mm -hmm. that gene. It doesn't mean they yeah. have the exact sequence as Corman yeah. Drosten has used. So how, how would a layperson go about evaluating that? There's just no way, right? Like, because there's no transparency. And I mean, I, I'd probably have to go to my regulators, uh, you know, methods as to like what assays they're using and which tests they've approved and then probably figure yeah, out so that way, right? I, I did put a thread on my Twitter feed on how to take someone's primers and screen them. 
Um, okay. So that, I think that's the place to start is find out what primer sets they're using. If they're if they won't disclose those, I think they should get them off the market. Um, there's that's that's it's, it's the public health and the public needs to know what they're being screened on. So. Um, those, uh, those primer sets, once you have them, there's some tools that you can throw them through to see whether or not they uh, bind to one another. Thermo has one on their website that looks for primer dimers. Uh, you can blast them against the human genome to make sure they don't have any, you know, poor homology to amplifying humans. Um, mm. And um, there, there might be some better tools out that look for all the variants too. I bet someone's built one of those by now because there's so many variants that you need to dance around when designing these things. You, know, you, you don't want to put them on top of uh, you know the, the delta variant, for example. That's a that's a, it's, it's an, that's a deletion in, in the region. If you put a primer there, it's just not going to amplify delta, and it's everywhere now. So, um, yeah, that we do need more transparency on what's being used. This is the real shame that's going on: is these primers are being used to, to lock down the world, and it's very difficult to get any of these organizations to be transparent about what's yeah. what the sequences are. Exactly. So let's say that the primers were perfect, and they were actually targeting the SARS-CoV-2 virus exactly. Uh, other than the the issues that we discussed with the CT correlating with uh, viral culture and you know the test testing positive after infection, what other problems do you think uh, that should be fixed that are that aren't currently being fixed right now with the patient? Well, I think I think they need internal controls because the variance in samplings is really critical. And if, could you ex could you explain what internal control is? So like and a lot of the tests out there they'll target a human gene as well. Like uh, an RNAsp is one that you'll see uh, quite frequently. Um, that is a gene that is, should be in the human genome, and uh, it can, you can use that to quantitate how much, how many human cells you got in your sampling process. And if that alone can vary, you know, a thousand to ten thousand fold, then you have a really hard time designing a CT cutoff for who's infectious and non-infectious because you, you're just measuring RNA, not knowing how many cells it came from. So you're lost. Uh, but when they have those internal controls, you can actually truly get a viral load. A viral load is known as a delta delta CT. Uh, those two deltas mean there's two different measurements that you're making, not one. So if you're just looking for viral RNA and you don't have the human DNA coming with it, you can't gauge viral load. It's false to even publish and claim you have viral load without an internal control. And that's a Mikey guideline. That's not my mm -hmm. guideline. Uh, so. Uh, I think it's really important they have those uh, they have those in place. Um, there should be ring tests going on, M many more ring tests, where you basically take a set of, of known positive and negative controls and you circulate them amongst all the laboratories. This is what we do for CLIA laboratories in the States. And then you see how many people got things right and wrong, and you publish that. And everyone tries to improve upon that, knowing that, oh, I got a couple right and a couple wrong. And most importantly, those ring tests, I think, need to be done um, in different seasonalities. I don't know what it's like in India, but here in the States, we get a really big spike in the wintertime. And when that happens, a whole background of other viruses come along for the ride. Like you get a lot of RSV, you get a lot of flu, mm -hmm. you get, uh, you know, the other coronaviruses are there. Those aren't present in the summer. So if you run these ring tests with live samples, uh, in the summertime, you're going to get a different picture of the background than, than when the vi when the virome all pops up into high gear in the wintertime. So could, I could you explain exactly what a ring test is? A ring test is you take a set of known positive and negative controls uh, where, you know, they're known true positives and known true negatives. And then you mix in, in a blinded fashion, a set of unknowns that um, are real patient samples, but someone who starts the ring test knows the answer. You then send those out to all the laboratories. They all send you the results back, and you get an, an, an estimation of, okay, how many of the positive and negative controls did they get correctly, and how many of the real live samples in the same batch that we sent out did they get correctly? So that would be like analogous to, like, let's say I, I was to do that test. I'd probably take a bunch of samples and actually do probably virus culture on them and see how many are truly positive and negative and then give those same samples to people and ask them to do PCR and see how many of those results come back in a similar fashion. Yes, and there's, I think it's important to have two different flavors of, of samples in here. There's samples that are live that, that you have, you've, you've, you've done a lot of, um, uh, you know, validation on, but they're, they're true samples that are in real matrix. You know, they have the, the, the swabbing and all that artifact present. And then there are these true negatives and true positives that in fact may be more simplified. They don't have matrix artifacts in them. They might be just DNA and RNA in certain wells that are, that are either blank or known, or they're an exclusion and exclusion set of organisms. Like you put a couple, you put flu in a couple wells and you put RSV in a couple wells and you want to make sure that the test doesn't falsely trigger off the wrong virus. That is often done with synthetic controls where, where they make the DNA in a laboratory and there's nothing but that DNA in there or RNA in this case. 
uh, and it's in water. Uh, that doesn't have any of the confusion over how well you sample a biological matrix. And, that, and those are important controls to run amongst all the laboratories. You'll see that in some of the EUAs in the United States is they'll, they'll run them through a panel of 20 inclusion or exclusion criteria to, to make sure that it doesn't, it does hit these SARS patients and it doesn't hit these particular viruses. But it, it is, I think, really important to get some matrix studies done in there where you're actually dealing with true nasal swabs that you've heavily characterized, like you've done some of the plating that you mentioned. That way um, you see how the test handles real world samples. You know, and, and this way you get an audit chain that you really understand from like car park until detector, uh, where can things go wrong? And I don't see a lot of that going on in the literature. You're, you, there's just people ramping these tests up to higher and higher volumes. And, and I don't think anyone has a real confidence that there isn't contamination going on in that process. When you scale PCR laboratories up that quickly, contamination is, is your worst enemy. So in a, in a brief way, how could we do this right? Like, let's say, I mean, you were advising the government and you wanted them to actually like do the PCR correctly and do the, the way we're doing the testing now in a correct fashion. Like, how would you go about, you know, asking them to do things? I, I would not do asymptomatic testing. I, I would look into the, the rat tests um, for, for addressing any of those types of concerns. If they're going to use PCR, they need to have internal controls, and I'd actually advise they test. If they don't have a viability PCR or a PCR assay that has been calibrated in the way that you suggested against a PFU curve that's seen in Rita Jafar's paper, um, then they should probably move to testing two different time points. That way they can see if the okay. viral load is going up or going down. Uh, that way they can declare someone truly infectious. So, um, so you're saying that other than testing, like calibrating the test against virus culture, they could also like do two tests to see how the viral load is changing and that would yes. be an idea. Of, uh, yeah, that, that, it's two, different day, two different days apart. You should be able to see the viral loads. If it's going up, you're infectious. If it's going down, you're not. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be, um, that, that would be the, probably the cleanest way to actually segregate those that are infectious from non-infectious. Um, and I think that's that's a very important thing to do. Otherwise, you're going to four to five of the people you test, 80 percent of the people you test are going to be non-infectious. That means you're going to quarantine not just random people. You're going to be quarantining hospital staff. You're going to be quarantining doctors. You're going to be quarantining many people that are critical in the whole supply chain. So it's very pertinent to, to leave the economy in place that you actually sharpen the, the knife on this. And they need to know that the testing companies do not want to do this because they will lose an order of magnitude of revenue. The only people that are going to really sharpen the pencil on this is, is political pressure. Got it. Yeah. So other than uh, using the internal controls, uh, you know, would you also have any other things like lowering the CT? Does the CT actually have like value for you with what well, you were talking about like the Delta Delta CT and stuff? It's hard to know where, how to refine the CT value if the tests aren't calibrated against a PFU curve. And if they're not taking, uh, you know, t taking into account the variation they get in the sampling, you know, I see people argue whether it should be 33, whether it should be 30. And it's like, well, if your sampling varies by 10 CTs, you're wasting your time arguing where this cutoff is. Mm -hmm. You're never going to find it. You need to make sure you're talking about really well calibrated viral loads in order for you to say a certain viral load is infectious or not infectious. I think don't don't we see in, in the paper like with uh, Jafar and the other papers, that despite all these uh, you know issues with the you know like the thing you're talking about that they vary in terms of the CT, we still see that uh, virus culture correlates with certain CTs. Like at 25, you have a certain probability of culturing. At 30, you have a certain probability of culturing. Do you think that's because they use the same assay and like tested everything, and that would actually change if they were to use multiple different ones? I do think those curves would shift if you switched assays. I, I don't know by how many CTs, but yeah, th there was a risk that they would shift. And the, you know, there's another paper out there from um, Stacy Gabriel and Michael Mina and Eric Landers Lab, where they the, the Broad C is probably the largest testing center here in the states. They're here in Cambridge, and they did this really interesting work where they looked at CTs of asymptomatic and symptomatic people, and they could barely split them apart. Um, so my only fear about Rita Jafar's work is that, yeah, they did have an interesting soundbite there that at like a CT of 33, like 97% of the people after that were not infectious. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I and worry that's what, about that's is that's what the particles court used as well to, you know, right, practice. right. I just don't know how sharp of a knife that is when you apply mm -hmm. it to every other assay that's out there. Uh, okay. and, uh, that that's, I, I would be concerned when I look at the work out of the bro that they had a very hard time segregating using CT alone. Uh, mm -hmm. Just viral CT alone, not not normalizing it with any delta delta CT mechanism. Just taking a single CT 
and asking, is there a pattern here? They could see them somewhat separate, like the asymptomatic people at slightly higher CTs, but if you picked any one CT, you were still gonna have a very large overlap with people that were symptomatic and people who were asymptomatic. So it wasn't a very sharp divide, but when you do these kind of averages, you you, you come to a, a conclusion like 33 on the case of Rita Jafar. So I, I'm a little nervous that it wouldn't be perfect unless you had two time points or you had Delta Delta CT and you had it really well calibrated. And Delta uh, Delta CT is when they're testing the internal human DNA control and yes. correlating that with the virus uh, CT, right? And exactly, then, yes. Yeah, that way their viral loads are much more precise. And now you can start having a really informed discussion about, mm. okay, what CT is, is really separates the asymptomatic from the symptomatic? So when you have an asymptomatic group of people and another symptomatic group of people, and if the sampling on those can vary a thousandfold, suddenly those those Venn diagrams overlap so much that it's really hard to say at any given CT I can separate the two. But so you're saying that with just the virus CT, it's very difficult to make out viral load. Like you need the human control CT. You need as human well. control. Yeah, technically you do not have a viral load if you have one fluorescent signal. You need a numerator and a denominator to get a viral right. load, which is the amount of virus RNA relative to number of human cells you sample. When you just blindly don't look at the human cells, you just have a viral number in space. You have no idea what the viral load of that patient is. Uh, you really need to, to, to quantitate it according to the, 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 the internal control data. So um, I'll tell you what we asked the government for. Like uh, we basically just, I mean, in, in our thing that we're gonna file in the court, we've told them that they should stop testing asymptomatics. You should yeah. implement the Mikey guidelines and that you should lower the CT down like uh, to 25. But with what you're saying, you're saying that even that CT is not very reliable if they're not, you know, correlating that with the human DNA CT. So, yeah, it's, it's very yeah. difficult to, to make a, a hard CT like that. I mean, I don't know the assay that you're speaking of, so I don't, I don't want to speak in generalities. Mm -hmm. here. Maybe it has been calibrated like Rita Jafar's work, in which case I think they've got the best argument for here's the CT cutoff and let's, let's run with it. But I would... I would caution making any CT, viral CT alone, that doesn't have a normalizing RNA's P signal or an internal control of some sort. Because so at least, would this be a reasonable thing to ask that any any uh, assay that, or test that you're approving, just make sure you've correlated it with virus culture first and see what the accuracy rate is and then roll it out. Yeah, with, that's, yeah. That's, that's standard in all the, we, we could never get away putting a PCR assay to the market not doing that. And we're in an unregulated cannabis space. I'm just shocked that we can do this in the human diagnostic space, that there aren't these types of calibrations that are being done. It's, that, that is, I think, critical. Now, there will be a pushback from a lot of the labs because a lot of the, the manufacturers are like, we don't want to have to grow that virus in our lab to mm. run those tests. So they may need to outsource that validation work to a few, a few facilities that are, that are under tight control, BL3. BSL3 labs, right? Yeah, BSL3 in, in India and, and get those things done. But... Um, they but what, Kevin, that. weren't you saying weren't you saying that we can actually get an idea of infectious infectiousness just using the PCR, but in a different way? Like you were saying that there's a certain PCR that can actually do that, right? Th there is, and it's a little bit earlier. Uh, the, the work was published recently. It is um, if you have if your group will Google up viability PCR or capsid PCR, you'll see a bunch of methods that leverage the fact that. You know, viruses actually evolved um, from viroids. Viroids are RNA molecules that don't have any protein coat. Eventually, a virus figured out to include a gene that, that creates a protein coat. The reason the virus creates that protein coat is it wants to protect itself from RNAs. RNAs are natural defense mechanisms to chew up foreign RNA. So once they have a protein coat, they're RNAs, they're RNAs resistant. So one method out there that people use is they throw in RNAs to chew up all the free-floating subgenomic RNA or all of the free-floating fragments of RNA. Um, and that, is, uh, that leaves only the capsid RNA present. Now, this could be a little bit complicated with the fact that some of the subgenomic RNAs are known to be in these double, wall or double membrane vesicles. They're not always extracellular debris. They're sometimes like in a, inside of an organelle that's inside of a cell, but they're not infectious pieces of RNA. The, the virus has this really interesting capacity that it makes a full length RNA, but it also makes like 15 to 18 of these other subgenomic RNAs that are non infectious, but they just increase the copy number of certain genes. Don't fully understand all that biology, but those other fragments often persist inside of a cell, inside of something known as a double, uh, a double wall vesicle or double membrane vesicle, they call them DMVs. Um, 
so those are, if a cell in your nose lyses open, it might have some of that subgenomic RNA. So the RNAs techniques that they're putting out there are meant to really, when you swab your nose, you should get viral particles that are fully intact in, in subgenome, in some of this RNA that's free floating. The RNA eats up all the free floating material, and now you only have capsids. Uh, and okay. then once you've done that, you can then crack open the capsids and PCR them and know that you're measuring only infectious load. Uh, there's a few papers that describe this already with SARS-CoV-2. I'll have to forward them to you so you can you can put them in the in the chat link. But that would probably have a much better correlation with PFUs. With culture. Yeah. 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 Great, got it, got it. Yeah, man. So that's, I mean, it's very great to have you on because uh, I got a lot of clarity just speaking with you on this, and it will definitely help our work as well. So thank you so much for that. I just wanted to shift gears a little bit and, you know, probably uh, go into the discussion about viruses in general. But I'd like you to comment on Carey Mullis and his views on the PCR because a lot of people in the health freedom movement typically uh, to kind of say that the PCR shouldn't be used. They talk about Mullis's views and they say that, uh, you know, Mullis said that, you know, the PCR is not meant for a diagnostic purpose. So would you like to? Share your thoughts on that. So yeah, I've um, I think I met Kerry at an LGBT conference once. So he was. Uh, it's unfortunate he's passed, but um, he. I think some of his quotes on this um, are reflective of his opinions on HIV and maybe mm. some of the earlier stages of PCR when we didn't have as where qPCR wasn't as refined. Um, and so we do definitely use quantitative PCR to diagnose um, certain uh, certain diseases, and I think his points are are relevant in that you've got to be careful that when you're just detecting RNA, you don't always know that that's infectious. We've had a long discussion about that. So I think that's one of his main concerns. And he was very adamant about that in the HIV e epidemic. Whenever you have a virus that has this much asymptomatic um, cases, right? You see a lot of people who just don't get symptomatic over this. In yeah. fact, when you look at the cohorts that are diseased with this, they tend to have two and a half comorbidities and you know 95% of the patients are comorbid, right? So this is really a virus that seems to be um, creating havoc in metabolically unbalanced people. Um, however, the vast majority of the population gets no symptoms from this. So when you start measuring just viral RNA and calling a case off of this, this is where Kerry's concerned. He's, I think what he was meaning to say is the presence of RNA does not mean you're sick in, in, in all cases. Some cases, the presence of an RNA molecule may be far more predictive of you having a disease. Uh, I mean, there are cases in cancer where they can look for the fusion gene of, of like a Philadelphia chromosome. And if that RNA is spliced in such a way that the chromosome 16 is attached to some other chromosome, that's pretty indicative that you may have that cancer, right? But in the case of, of these asymptomatic viruses, the vast majority of cases, a lot of people are walking around with this and they're not sick. So it's not a diagnostic in the sense that it tells you who's sick or not. It may be an additional diagnostic tool to help you review someone who has symptoms or has D-dimer levels or a troponin is off, all types of things that are known to be involved in SARS biology. But the actual virus alone is only a hint, not necessarily a deterministic answer. So, I th And I think he was also pointing to the fact that some people tend to run these cycles out to 45 cycles or higher, and mm. you're going to just start to get anything to amplify at that point. It may not even be the virus that you're that you think, or the RNA sequence that you think is diagnostic if you run them too long. So, um, I've seen that script. I've seen that 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 um, video of his, and you know, I, I think it's if you don't have the greater context of the conversation, you could easily take it to say, oh, the inventor of PCR doesn't believe in PCR, but I, I, he certainly did. I think he's just warning people that. Um, people leap to some conclusions by finding a single RNA molecule when, when biology is often much more complicated than that. I think uh, I've seen like in this this in our movement, people use your uh, you know critique of the common Rosson paper and Carrie's views to just debunk the PCR as a whole. Like it just can't do anything. When even your position, even with your critiques of the assays interacting with themselves and water and all the other critiques that you said, you're still saying that the PCR can work if it's made better. And I think I absolutely. Feel the same, right? Yeah, no, we use PCR every day in my field, and I'm a big believer in it. And my reason for speaking out is I'm just shocked at how poorly it's been implemented in COVID testing uh, and how rapidly it's been rolled out to destroy people's rights. Um, this is something that would have never happened uh, a few years ago. We would have been far more uh, careful about calling medical cases on people that didn't, when you run asymptomatic yeah. testing, it's just it's gone out, it's gone off the rails. But it's a very useful and helpful tool. Um, I think in the race to get this pandemic, um, what you know, supercharged or whatever, they just ran to market with really carelessly designed PCR products, and mm. 
there, there has, it's been very difficult to roll it back because there's now it's probably a $15 billion market now uh, on PCR testing alone. So there's a tremendous amount of lobbying power with that money and it's hard to get them to refine the testing. So they pick up less people because they very much are, were motivated to have very wide cast, very wide nets for contact tracing. Good. Yeah. Even I'm involved in the functional medicine space and we actually use a, a couple of tests like GI map, you know, for people who come in with gut issues and, you know, that actually has PCR targets for many different kinds of parasites and bacteria and viruses oh, and stuff. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we use a lot of, I mean, like this is another problem I found with the way PCR is being used right now is that they're just looking for one SARS-CoV-2 target. Whereas the way in which some functional medicine people actually use, you know, testing that involves PCR, we tend to look at multiple viruses and bacteria together and yes. parasites together yeah. to see like what's going on over there. Right. So how, how valuable is it to just go to someone if they, let's say they have like respiratory symptoms and just do, doing like SARS-CoV-2 PCR on them. Don't you think that should be combined with like testing for other viruses at the same time? Yeah, see, BioFire like, does this. They do, They have like 21 different um, assays that look for RSV. They look for, I, I think you're, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, this this monomaniacal focus on SARS means, I, I think we're over labeling a lot of patients as SARS when they might in fact have RSV, they might have flu. They might. There, there's a weird thing going on here in the States in where there is different liability if you're a SARS patient. In the hospitals, they've lowered the liability. There's no liability, I think, for SARS patients. There's better reimbursement if you're a SARS patient. So if you test everybody for SARS first and you get a hit, you never see if they also have flu. They might be asymptomatic with SARS, but have the flu, right? Um, so those panels, I think, are really, really important. So you get a whole profile of what, what virus is actually there. I mean, you can imagine someone who got over SARS six weeks ago and then gets RSV. But if you test them for SARS first, they're going to be positive for C19. You'll never see the RSV. Um, so I, I think running those panels are the only way to go, actually. I, I prefer if, if the system went that way because we start looking at this as more of a virome as opposed to a, a single mm. virus. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen multiple papers, at least I've read them on. Like, There's a paper that looked at the blood DNA virome of like 8,000 healthy people. And they found that you know they, they had like they could sequence uh, HIV and papilloma virus and all these things in people who didn't even have any symptom necessarily. So I think there's there's one argument that okay even if you find SARS-CoV-2 like that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sick from it right because you could just have it as an asymptomatic healthy person and it could be part of your viral. And there's the other thing that I see a lot of people again in our movement uh, you know talk about that the CDC has discontinued the PCR. Like there's this whole thing going around that the CDC is going to stop using the PCR test from December. Oh, and, uh, that's not I, true, right? I think that's just them discontinuing the assays that are um, EUA because now some of the assays, some of the manufacturers have come out and gotten them graduated above EUA status in the FDA. And they want to they want to basically sunset the old ones and make force everyone to use the things that are more certified. I think that's a good idea. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of – you know, the only only frustration I have is that it took the FDA this long to actually review them. You know, we've we've run almost the entire pandemic now on EUA products, and um, now Thermo has, has sharpened the pen and has they removed um, the uh, the TAC path assay from the market as an EUA because it had this S gene target failure, but they've since brought in something through the FDA that has eight targets. Um, and that that's going to be more bomb proof trying to get around all these scariants they keep talking about. So no, and, and the CDC, I think, also came out with a recommendation to use the multiplex method where they're looking at SARS-CoV-2 and influenza together. Right. Like in, in the same I think method. that's going to be very critical because there are all these bizarre billing incentives that make people once they get a SARS diagnostic, they don't want to reflex and do a flu. Um, hospitals are usually liable for nosocomial infections for flu. They don't have that for, for SARS. So they, they're motivated to keep everyone in the SARS bucket. So this thing is never going to end if we don't start uh, treating SARS the same way we treat every other respiratory virus in the hospital. There will be weird billing incentives that, that bucket more people into the wrong uh, in the wrong category. So running them at the same time means you can't hide from it. If it's positive for for both at that time, then you've got to stop and ask, all right, how how old is the SARS virus? Do an antibody test. Maybe it shows that the SARS is from six 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 weeks ago and. We really have to be paying attention to the flu here and put them on Tamiflu, not put them on ivermectin or whatever. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that's um, I mean, that's an interesting point I'd love to ask you about. And from India, I saw some suggestions that the, the vaccine rollout wasn't scaling there just due to the population size. And they started implementing ivermectin for a period of time. But I think they stopped it as the pandemic started to wane. I don't, was that due to any fear in, in the use of ivermectin or was it that it seemed like it accomplished its job? 
ivermectin is pretty complicated out here like doctors have had mixed views on it and i'll i'll give you some perspective so the lawyers that we're working with right now uh I, i don't i think you must have seen this on twitter but uh, we are working with the lawyers from the iba there's the indian bar association so dipali oja from there has been doing a lot of interviews with uh, you know people doctors promoting ivermectin abroad like uh, dr tess lorry and pia korean and you know like people like that right and they actually uh, sent a notice to the who and swami swami nath and the chief scientist uh that you know you're suppressing ivermectin as a cure and uh, they even did a case out here in i think goa high court uh, with respect to that because there are a couple of states that uh, basically were using it but the who said that they should stop using it so there's a lot of controversy around that so ivermectin is is really like makes a lot of doctors have used it out here they stopped using it uh, there's a state called uttar pradesh out here where they use ivermectin and their case loads seem to be much better than states that haven't used it so there's that kind of right. data but like it's, it's very segregated you i can't give you like a country wide picture of what happening in the ivermectin other than like there's a lot of awareness around it now and many uh, you know clinicians are are using it i think a lot of clinicians also have the idea that they were using it earlier but they thought it's not showing effects so some of them stopped using it so it's It's kind of all over the place i can't give you a straight answer not, not a hard study on it yeah interesting yeah. i mean i did notice that at least with the timings of the press release that there seemed to be a really high case load spike in india and then they declared ivermectin in, in a few of the provinces there and it seemed like a drop yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah knowing in the one that didn't use it and i thought mm. that was a yeah those correlations are there did they yeah yeah but yeah. who knows yeah the correlations aren't always proof so um yeah well that's interesting i mean that that is something that uh i i think it will p- probably have an impact on the pcr in that i from what i'm seeing with the vaccination program it's such a narrow selection that they're applying on the spike that we're tending to get a lot of mutations pile up mm. in the spike now and that it seems as if the evolution is it's like a selective pressure of anti spikes so the virus is going to evolve and have you'll see selective pressure applied in the sequences in the spike protein that's going to a lot of the pcr primers that are designed to capture spike are probably going to get tripped up on that they're going to get tripped up on vaccinated patients as well i suspect but the ivermectin is very interesting to me in that it actually has some reported um activity reducing the the RDRP like it reduces the the RNA polymerase which means it should slow evolution if it inhibits the polymerase there's no evidence that the next one paper where the ivermectin like reduced the viral load by 5000% or something but i'm not sure like what what target they were looking at that's right so that that's a big difference than than the vaccine the vaccine they're now saying they they don't think it changes the viral load which means the evolutionary experiment is ongoing but if ivermectin actually suppresses the viral load um that means the there's going to be less mutations uh and of course the people who develop immunity to uh, when they're treated with ivermectin will get epitopes built across the entire you know their their immune profile will be built across many more epitopes there's 29 kb of epitopes when you see the natural virus and you treat it with ivermectin there's a much narrow window with just spike only vax so i i i suspect there'll be more durable immunity in in india as a result of this because i think there was more there's probably more doses of that given than the vaccine is my understanding but I don't actually I'm, I'm curious if you know where to look for that data because um I heard they I don't think that's about it. I'm sure we'll be able to find something. Yeah, okay. That that that'd be very very helpful. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of uh, the folks in that community would want to want to know because that's a it's such a, a cheaper alternative. I'm hearing the the yeah, vaccines are, you know, 12 to 66 bucks a shot from the the Pfizer leak that came out. So that looks like it's um ivermectin could be tenfold cheaper. Yeah I want to discuss the treatments with you a little bit but I just want to get two things out of the way so one thing is that CDC thing so a lot of people in our community have been saying that the CDC stop using the PCR but that's not true because what they're saying is that they're going to start using assays that actually like test for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and influenza at the same time so I think that's that's pretty clear and the other thing I want to discuss with you is this whole uh, conversation about uh, viruses not existing and not causing disease because I think even uh, Carry Mullis like with his time with uh, Peter Dusburg and the entire HIV right. debate I think those those people are arguing from the same camp and now we have people like Stephen Lanka and some other virologists that also claim that viruses don't exist and don't cause any disease and you know there's a lot of critiques about like this debunking the PCR uh, totally and you know debunking even like whole genome sequencing techniques and basically claiming that is they're just like stringing up some things together and it's computer generated would you like to like share thoughts on that and clear out some of that Yeah, so my sense is the virus absolutely exists. I've seen really interesting papers on spatial trans- transcriptomics where they actually um they have these great sequencing tools now where you can sequence in situ and get a map of where all the RNA is in the cell and then uh, they barcode it with some interesting tricks, DNA barcode it. And then 
um, they go and sequence the RNA. So they not only get an understanding of where the uh, of how much RNA is there and what its sequence is, but they get a, a positional location in the cell as to where it is. And I think that's more valuable than than even an SEM of a virus because you you get you get the entire genetic code of the RNA and where you see it inside of the tissue. Um, and they, they, that spatial transcriptomics work has been done and uh, on SARS. So I do believe there's a virus floating, circulating around. All the PCR data we have and all the sequencing data, I think, supports this. I think it's a valid debate on how much of this is actually causing this disease. There is so hmm. much comorbidity going on. And, and the average age of death in the United States is like the average lifespan. And that, that alone is a sign that these are mostly people that are sick with other things. And the virus might be the trigger that pushes them into their last stage of life, right? But there's so many people walking around with this. The other thing we don't have a good handle on is how latent is this virus? Does it hang out in other places in our body, like in the GI for long periods of time that we don't understand? Because um, you see these cases where people go to Antarctica and they're all clean before they go and a case pops up there. How did it get there, right? Uh, there are boats that are all vac vaccinated and they're mm -hmm. all screened. They go to go out to ocean and bang, it shows up. Um, so th those are all cases that are um, that are usually good arguments for latency. I mean, they saw this in the 1918 flu. When you saw the, the breakout in the 1918 flu, it happened in New York and in Europe at similar times, but there's no airplanes to fly people and connect people like there is today. So we have too much, I think, emphasis on this geometric com contact map because that politically divides people. Uh, I actually think there may be something going on with this virus where it actually stays dormant in your system. And when the environment changes, uh, it emerges in a population. Um, and we're not I don't think we're paying enough attention to that. And we, we see that in other viruses, like even even HIV has some level of, of latency and that people never really eliminate that virus just to its integration capacity. But they really try and push people below a certain copy per ml. Uh, but, you know, your immune system can get wrecked later and it can come back. So I, I think there's been too much emphasis on this. All right, you touched that person and that person gave it to you. To like, no, you, it might just be endemic now. And the mm. people whose immune systems get wrecked in the next, you know, coming into the winter, it's going to start to emerge. Um, this might also be what's behind um, in a lot of the countries right now. If you look at the highly vaccinated countries, you're seeing really strong case spikes, like in Israel and Iceland, right? Yeah. I think Gabor Adosi said on that, like I actually had him on the show before this and he's done an interesting Twitter thread where like he goes into the, like the entire latent reactivation thing that the vaccines could be driving that, right? Yes. I, I don't have any proof of this other than I've seen some really intelligent people on Twitter kind of discuss this and other viruses, yeah. temperature dependent and how that temperature shifts and humidity shifts can actually reactivate these things. Um, but I think that's something that we need to be considering because um, it's going to eventually... It, it may even blow up the vaccine programs. There are all these countries are seeing these huge spikes. Now, is that because, I mean, you look at the Pfizer data, there's neutropenia after the first shot, right? So that would weaken your immune system. And if you already had a little bit of SARS in you, bang. Um, it's also- is, is, is this neutropenia for the viewers? Is neutropenia when your neutrophils like go really low? It's neutropenia. They said 46% of the patients in the vaccine arm had neutropenia. No, no, I mean, um, like, what, what is neutropenia for, for the viewers? Is that when you're oh, neutrophils? Okay. Really it's low? reduction in neutrophils, and, and they also yeah. saw reduction in lymphocytes. So basically, your, um, your white blood cell count goes down. Mm. Uh, that's going to make you more exposed to viruses. Um, yeah. So, uh, And th this, I think, also gets in the way of understanding the, R, the change in the R0 of the Delta variant. Everyone's been saying it's higher, but um, is it higher or is it more endemic? And once you vaccinate these people, suddenly you get, you get a, you get a, a, the people who had low levels of SARS now have high levels of SARS because you wiped out their white blood cells. It, it's, it's hard to imagine that, that after vaccination, everyone ran out and had a huge party and we were suddenly were more mobile and, and passing this around more. But I mean, both, both, both hypotheses are on the table. It's just, I, I think the, the, um, they've completely ignored whether there's any latency to this thing. And we do know that it sits in the GI for much longer. Like you can get PCR positive samples out of the feces much longer than you can out of the nose. So mm. there are pockets of the body where it seems to be harboring or hanging out longer than usual. So it's, it's reason to believe it may in fact, uh, it, it may spark up at a later time. Um, I think a lot of people have a uh, real skepticism around this whole virus question because there are many questions with respect to, like how we really isolate a virus. Like a lot of people have critiqued the entire method of isolating yeah. viruses themselves. And they basically say that uh, you you can't dis dis uh, differentiate between an exosome and a virus. And uh, you can't actually like 
filter it down into like a you know the final viral particle and it's always surrounded by debris so do you have any yeah. insights on, on those questions? i put a thread together on on cox postulates and i probably point people to that but okay um, i it is it, you know it was never meant for viruses because viruses are you know they don't live on their own they need a host and so i think what gets really what really complicates the discussion with asymptomatic viruses in particular uh, is that for you to fulfill Koch's postulates, you, you, you've got to actually take the virus and put it in a model organism. We don't like to put it in people due to ethical reasons. And you have to hope that that model organism gets symptomatic. And yeah. even in humans, if you were to put it, if you could find a way to ethically put it into humans, um, even they don't always get symptomatic, right? Yeah. So it's very hard to fulfill them when you're dealing with a virus that seems to only be complicating comorbid elderly mm. right yeah yeah um so no, that's, I, I, that's the argument i use against the uh, people who claim that vaccines cause autism it's just not like every child who gets vaccinated lands up with autism but no, yet I, these yeah. people claim that vaccines you, cause know, autism. you know and autism is so broad there's like th at least yeah. three thousand genes involved in this so it's not one disease it's 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 three thousand yeah I, that, I, don't, I don't think Koch's postulates are logical to begin with because they assume that there's just like one cause and one disease whereas like health is pretty multifactorial and there's a lot of things going on that right. makes someone sick right Right. Yeah, but I mean, uh, if I, I discussed this uh, with Jeremy Hammond, he's another investigative journalist from America itself who came on like uh, early on the podcast. So we went into this in great detail, but I just wanted some more clarity because I mean, people still had some questions as to like, why don't we isolate viruses directly? Like, why can't I just take your throat sample and try to isolate a virus from there? Like if they're doing a swab well, test, done they, they have them. Yeah, they've got bronchial yeah. lavage cultures from patients in Washington early. You can get them at ATCC. Um, directly but, uh, from directly from the sample, like not taking them through monkey kidney cells and growing them. And then well, that, that's them. the thing is they they yeah. usually trigger some of the people's concerns that when you when you get a bronchial lavage sample, you've got to culture it in something, and um, they usually use viral cells. Now, if you look at the seeds, yeah, but that's, that's that's the argument, right? Like the, these these people claim that why do you want to grow it in a cell if the virus is already there? Why don't you just like isolate it from the sample itself? Like why? Why do you need to grow it in another cell and then uh, like? Uh, I think it's just a, it's a yield issue. I mean, when you get it out of the lavage, okay. maybe you only have a million of those particles, and separating those from everything else is uh, you need a lot of sample to do that. Um, okay. But I mean, that's a fair that's a fair point. So let's say they could find a way to isolate those viruses. What would convince them that they're the infectious agent? There, right. There's some there's some questions around ultra centrifugation also because I've I've looked into some of the technologies and they actually like claim that they can like centrifuge and ultra centrifuge the thing down to like just viral particles and there's nothing around. Do we have right. the capability to do that? So so if you let's say you, you do do that and you you collect them, you then would probably want to SEM them and sequence them. I would guess and then maybe infect something with them to prove that they're an infectious agent. And I think it's when you get to that last point, what are you going to put it in? Uh, you can because the CDC shows if you put these in a bunch of human cell lines, um, there's there's like log scale lower PFUs than if you put them into viral cells, and and they argue that's because those are immortalized cell lines that already have an EBV infection. They they immortalize a lot of human cell cell lines with Epstein Barr virus. Yeah, uh, that's that's the other question that people have. Like, why do why do they use monkey kidney cells? Like, why don't they use human cells if they're trying to see if it's infectious to humans in these? isolation studies yeah so th there's a, there's a paper on that they have done it there's a paper at the cdc that i've got to point you to um that has all the, the different human cell lines and how well they they're they in fact how many pfus okay. they make according to virus cells and they're, they're just the virus cells are just way more sensitive uh and so they 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 can they can get better quantitation that way than they can with the, the human cell lines they have and uh, maybe they'll find a better human cell line for this but i i think the human cell lines they initially had that they used for this they they tend to immortalize those cell lines and to immortalize them you kind of change their behavior um and that, that's that, i think that's what's playing a role in it but they have shown that it can affect some human cells just not as well as the viral cells do so now, sure. now once the rna is in the viral cell uh, you know, we're, let's say we're going on this road of Cox postulate. You ultra centrifuge it. You get a nice set of particles. You sequence them to confirm what the hell it is. You take a nice SEM picture for eye candy in a journal. You then want to go put it into some cells. At that stage, even the the folks in the Cox Cox postulates and reverse postulates start throwing flags because, well, how do you know that it's not triggering all these other viruses and exosomes, right? Hmm. The only thing we can do is do trans, you know, spatial transcriptomics at that point and show you that this virus got into the cell. We can see it near the mitochondria, and we can see that it's creating more more virions. 
Um, and so some of that work has been done on bronchial lavage samples. I'll have to so find you're, saying, you're saying that they have ways to differentiate between exosomes and viruses because that's that's another thing that, that comes up often in this whole debate. Uh, well, you can tell by the protein coats that are on them. Okay. So this one particular uh, paper was actually correlating the spatial transcriptomic works and, and the proteins. So you can see that, okay, there's spike protein on this. The, the spike protein, the, the, the viruses tend to have a much tighter distribution in size than the exosomes. The exosomes can vary a lot more in size and they're not always necessarily decorated. And to the extent that an exosome is decorated with spike protein, it's probably infectious, right? I mean, at that point, they're, they we're, we're starting to split hairs on what an exosome is and what a virus is. Yeah, yeah. But, but do, you, do, you think, do you think they're the same thing somewhere or do they like correlate? I are certainly we, think that they, they yeah. probably have evolutionary history together. Um, mm. Probably the earliest, you know, viruses probably started off as exosomes, and uh, eventually they maybe maybe they they matured, um, or or vice versa. You know, there's obviously viruses probably predate um, human cells making uh, viruses. But you you look at the human genome, like eight percent of it is virus. Um, mm. Up to forty percent of it has viral elements like alu and line and signs. So the human genome is really just a graveyard of viruses. So, um, and we know that the cells love to use exosomes to communicate. And, and I, I don't yeah, really yeah. get overly wrapped up on whether it's an exosome or a virus because uh, either one of them could possibly spread genetic material. Um, do, do we know like what's the genetic makeup of an exosome? Like do, do we have like- It's very different. different. Yeah, they're, they're communication vesicles. So a lot of them are packaged and, and sent to throughout the circulatory system for you to send signals to other organs. So um, they're, uh, it's, it's a very nascent field, but there's a lot of people that are doing sequencing and proteomics and exosomes to try and understand cancer and, and other diseases. So would this would this come up in BLAST? Like, let's say these, these Chinese scientists isolated SARS-CoV-2 and they basically like put it on BLAST to see, uh, you know, what, what matches and like to, to construct the phylogenetic tree, they basically like put oh. it over there. Would the exosome sequences come up as well? The, so this is the thing about that, that I think um, draws a lot of question into this. So if it's an exosome, Hmm. Where is it coming from? Because we don't see SARS sequence in the human genome. I mean, there's small segments of homology, but it's not the whole 29 KB is not embedded in the human genome. So if, if they are exosomes and they're budding this RNA sequence, where the hell is it coming from? Because um, it's pretty clear that sequence has been detected all over the globe in multiple different independent laboratories. That I, I don't believe this thing that the, they spread that the virus doesn't exist. I mean, the RNA sequence yeah. exists. That no, but that's, that's the thing. Like when when you go into the entire genomic side of the argument, they basically say that like whole genome sequencing is a fraud as well because it's yeah, just. Yeah, well, I mean that. They're, <laughs> yeah, they're basically throwing out all science, and yeah, I don't know what. To yeah. Do. So if you if you could just touch on that a little bit, and probably before you touch on that, I just want to clear out one more thing. Uh, there's another argument that when they're trying to grow these viruses in cell cultures, they use formaldehyde and other kinds of like things that they claim that those toxins are actually damaging the cells and then the exosomes are coming out and then that's what's being sequenced. So yeah. like, can we can we do this whole process without using formaldehyde and things like that? And what uh, impact do you think it has? It's a good question. I've got to look into some of those protocols a bit more, but yeah, there usually are some antibiotics at play and some things hmm. that stress the cells and, and make yeah. them more prone to making exosomes. But um, I mean, I, I think the real question at hand is if you have proteomic data that shows that, okay, here's the RNA sequence and we can see there's spike protein getting synthesized and made and packaged. Um, you know, what, what else is there to tear apart? I mean, the, the, yeah. I could understand their concern if the RNA is just floating around and not active. But mm. they've seen proteins being made that, that, that match the proteins as predicted off of the RNA sequence for the genome. So and it's they would do this with whole genome sequencing technologies. Like they do it with a mixture of, of mass spec proteomics and, and, and sequencing, yeah. Uh, so okay. the people have run both. They'll, they'll run the whole genome RNA sequencing on this stuff, and they'll also go and confirm that they can find spike protein and, and nucleocapsid and, and e-gene proteins being synthesized. So they know that the whole transcription translation machinery is complete. So to figure this stuff out, you kind of have to be involved in bioinformatics, right? Like that's when you actually be able to like know what's going yeah. on after the whole genome sequencing is done. Right. Yeah, it, it's, um, I have seen some folks do that, they, you know, they'll quickly throw some bioinformatics at this and say, hey, look, I found a 19 base pair homology to the human genome, therefore SARS comes from the human genome. That's, yeah, yeah that's, that's a, a 19 mirror isn't enough. You know, you, you, there, there are homologies like this due to all the viral background in the human genome, but you really need to see the whole 29 KB in the, in the, in the genome for you to be, be concerned about okay. this. And, uh, and finally, could you just touch on this, uh, I mean, this concern people have with whole genome sequencing, like, could you just explain the process and like, why like that's accurate in terms of actually because a lot of the critiques 
have been that you know whole genome sequencing basically like breaks down the virus into like small fragments and then yeah. sequences them and then puts everything together so like there's some truth to that so um but however there is also oxford nanopore out now that doesn't do that um yeah. and they have to run oxford on this and that's really actually some fascinating experience so um for the listeners there the so illumina sequencing is uh, makes there's 150 bases of sequencing usually on both ends of the molecule so about 300 bases of sequence that's not 29,000 letters. So what you have to do is mm -hmm. a lot of these fragments and then piece them back together in an assembly process um, or map them back to an expected reference sequence. It's usually better to do the assembly stuff because you find more information that way. Um, however, this virus is so small and not very repetitive that that process works very well. In fact, uh, you can find 25 MERS and 50 MERS are usually long enough to be fairly unique in 80% of the human genome. There's probably another 20% of the genome that you really can't map unless you have 20,000 base pair reads, right? There's, there are repeat elements that are very large. When you get down to viruses that are just small, there aren't repeat elements that are very that are much longer than your 300 bases of read length for Lumina. So the assemblies are actually really straightforward and, and simple. There's some poly A regions of the virus that get a little noisy, and there's a couple repeats where you get some more prone error and mistakes. Uh, there, there are triplet repeats that happen with Illumina sequencing. And we know about those and we know to call very cautiously in those regions. However, if that were, you know, if that were the only sequencer we had, I could see where people would be drawing some criticism that maybe we're miscalling certain regions of the genome. Hmm. However, we've got PacBio now on this, which does single molecule 20 KB reads that um, are as accurate as Sanger sequencing. The people that have run Oxford Nanopore as well, this is a system that has higher error rates, but it can read the RNA directly without converting it into DNA. So you actually are reading like RNA, full genome RNA from poly A tail all the way to the five prime end with no DNA assembly. You do have to put those reads together to error correct them because the error rates aren't as good, but it's the assembly problem isn't as complicated as the Illumina problem. It's just really an error correction process at that stage. So um, the assembly on this stuff is rock solid. I, I, I'm not, um, nearly as, as concerned about whether or not uh, the, the assembly is getting the, this correct as I am about the PCR primers potentially missing it or, or confusing it for different viruses. That there is but if, if, there. If, there are, if there are these errors in the sequencing and you know we are finding variants when it's like one nucleotide changing, how, how do they like correct for that? Like is it an, so, a sequencing error or is it an actual variant? Well, that's a, it's a good question. They usually will put quality scores on each of these variants based on how well the sequencing chemistry is behaving. And that's usually in a scale from an odds ratio of you having like a one in a 1% 1 chance of error to a one in a million chance of error with Illumina. Uh, and when they do that, if they, if they see a variant, they're going to want to see that variant in the virus. Uh, I, I think most of the variants that they're going to be looking for in this virus are probably homoplastic variants, meaning they're, they exist in every single read that you read. This is um, perhaps different than cancer biology or mitochondrial biology, where you can have heteroplasmic variants. We'll say like 10% of the viruses in the body have a change at that location versus 90% have a different change, right? Uh, or have the, have the reference base. When you start getting into like heteroplasmic counting, you have to start worrying about your error rates, like you're saying. There are some places with the Lumina sequencing where it makes a mistake, but a very low frequency. And so people tend not to call those variants if it's close to their noise floor. Um, I don't know. There's a couple papers that have been published on like certain regions in the genome where the Illumina platform makes a little bit more error. But they've well categorized those now with over probably a million genomes that they've sequenced. And they, they, they have a good understanding of, of where those tend to make mistakes and where not to go chasing a ghost on a variant of concern because it's in a, a homopolymer stretch. That's a region right. of genomes that some of these short read sequencers have challenges with. Almost all the sequencers have challenges when you have like nine or 10 bases of the same base in a row, discerning whether it's nine or 10 is somewhat error prone. Um, fortunately, many of those places aren't coding regions. They don't change the amino acid uh, structure that's, that's being predicted. So they're usually silent variants that people don't care about anyway. But um, they are, um, they can happen occasionally in coding regions and triplet, triplet repeat regions. So um, I, I think the, I think those are all, um, you know, red herrings people are chasing, trying to just dismantle that that sequencing doesn't work and therefore, mm -hmm. you know, the virus is made up. But it's a real stretch at this point, the amount of sequencing that's been done. This is the most sequenced virus we've ever seen. Nothing's been sequenced. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, at least you can vouch for the fact that nothing's being made up. Like all the nucleotides that are being found, I mean, even I've looked into the different sequencing technologies 
and how they replace like you know the thing they're finding with the, the nucleotide and actually construct the whole thing so at least like when i looked into this because i i heard a lot of claims and specifically since we're not all steeped in these fields we don't like have a head start like you to figure this stuff out so just like me discovering it at least i could make sure that you know they were not making anything up like they were actually finding what was what was there in the material but the only criticism has been that it's kind of like piecing it together so how does that happen if you could just like explain in a so the assembly process how do they piece it together in a line yeah so like, let's say you have these 250 base pair reads um they then have a million more of those and their computers just look for alignments if you have 150 bases here you look for mm -hmm. 140 that overlap with another one and that okay. 140 of overlap has a really high statistical value of it being right just because it's so long that it's unlikely that you can place that 140 base pair alignment anywhere else in, in, in the genome. It doesn't fit in the human genome, it doesn't fit anywhere else in the virus genome. So there are, there's the statistics on those things being wrong, they, it only gets a little shady when you start shrinking this below 25 bases, those alignments can then be promiscuous and you may not perfectly line things together, but when you have yeah. paired 300 MERS, you have really strong confidence that this thing is getting assembled correctly right. and that you, and then on top of that, they don't just sequence these things like 10 times over. They're often the depth on these things is like a hundred X coverage. Like they, they, they're really hammering the hell out of the sequencing depth so that they can call rare variants that they need to. Uh, that gives you even more confidence that you have that many reads that are confirming your answer. Uh, in, in many ways in, in, the, in the scientific fields that I've operated in, there are very few things that have as high of a confidence rating on them that are statistically measured as DNA sequencing. You can't get these this level of quality scores with mass spec. You can't get these level of quality. There's really nothing else out there where you can get this much damn data that's that's quantitatively known from an accuracy standpoint applied to a biological question. Uh, it's really the most probably the most powerful measurement tool that we have. So if you want to throw that one out, you're back to the earth is flat. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean I've I've seen I think a new sequencing technology that was able to like do ten thousand pairs of this at, at like at one go. Up compared to like uh, you know 200 or 300 that other sequencing technology. Oh yeah, they, the the Oxford boxes are getting really powerful. Um, there's also the I think that's uh, that's another that's a nanopore system. But even the Illumina, they, they now have systems that just do terabases of sequence at a time. I can't imagine trying to yeah. fill AnovaSeq with just SARS data. You'd need you know 20,000 libraries or something to be thrown on there at a single time because they're right. uh, they, they 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 pump out so much damn data on this. Um, now, you know, with that said, uh, the, the best, when you get involved in plant genomes, I do a lot of plant genomes that are like 70% repeat content. They're polymorphic, meaning there's a mother and a father genome commingled. Um, there's 64% AT. So the, the base balance is all off and they have a variant every 50 bases, right? That those type of genomes, Illumina has trouble with. And that's probably where they're getting their critique is that, Hey, look, you can't assemble a plant genome. You get all this mess when you try and do that with Illumina. And they're right about that. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have to go to PacBio and Oxford Nanopore for that. Usually PacBio's Hi-Fi system is really the only system that can nail these really complicated genomes. But when you get in these tiny 29 KB genomes, these are not complicated puzzles to put together. You could probably assemble them in Excel if you had to on your laptop. I mean, they're, it's, it's a very small um, problem that you're trying to solve. And the sequencing read length from Illumina is plenty long enough to, to address the question. Got it, man. That gives a lot of clarity. Thank you so much. And uh, just finally to touch on this uh, topic, there were some claims made by David Martin, I think, a couple of weeks ago that, uh, you know, the, the, the virus is not a novel virus and it's something that has existed from before. I think you posted a Twitter thread on that as well. Do you have any insight on that? So I can't vouch for everything um, he's claimed. I, I just I happen to know one piece of, this, of the story he put forward that didn't resonate with what I know about patent law. So. Um, he, he had some claims that the CDC illegally filed a patent on the virus. And um, I've published some papers on methods that navigate uh, patent uh, gene patents, but they're probably less relevant now post Myriad. Um, so the Myriad claims that the Myriad space here is a bit complicated. This virus was filed by the CDC, I think back uh, prior, 10 years prior to um, the Myriad case in the United States. It's a case that, that, subtly changed patent eligibility in the genomic space. Um, and the way that the case law um, really was laid down by, by um, Clarence Thomas was that he believed it was still patent eligible if you man modified it. Okay. So if you just took natural DNA and sequenced it and patented it, he said, no more of that. All right. You have to actually manipulate it somehow. 
to have the craft, you know, the hand of man involved in order for it to be patent eligible. And this goes back to a lot of diamond versus Chakrabarty court work, and it goes back to Park Davis purification of adrenaline. There are all these cases that build up to this case. Now, the thing that he itemized in that process, and I think it was 2010 um, or 2013, perhaps, uh, he came to the conclusion that, like, for he made the example that if you made a cDNA, for example, that would be enough of a man modification that that would probably make it patent eligible because you converted RNA into DNA. So you, you changed it. It's no longer natural. Your the methylation is no longer there. It's no longer RNA. Mm -hmm. It's a different chemical configuration. All types of arguments as to why the conversion of RNA to DNA would satisfy the patent 101 and 102 eligibility. Um, so the interesting thing about SARS-CoV-2 is it's exactly what the CDC did, is they converted the RNA into cDNA to sequence it. And they made the, their claims change from when they filed to when it issued that showed that that specifically listed a you know a DNA sequence that was um, it wasn't strictly a DNA sequence it was a modified DNA sequence as listed right so they made claims even prior to Clarence Clarence Thomas's correction of this that still survived Clarence Thomas's uh, you know case law so I think their patent is still valid I don't think they've ever gone after anybody for it. it's for SARS one. Um, I'm not seeing anybody license it. I'm not seeing the, the patent number on any of the PCR kits that are out there. So I think it's an irrelevant patent. Um, but he's made a case that, oh, this is some huge collusion with the CDC illegally filing something. And there's there's conspiracy theory lines to Bill Gates and everybody else trying to collude on this. And I, I'm, I don't think that's the – there's a lot of things going on in this, in this pandemic that are wrong. If we put our eggs in that basket, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Um, and he may have some other points that are very valid. I just can't confirm them because I'm not as familiar with those. But going after this for the CDC, having done some type of illegal collusion on the patent, I think is going to go nowhere uh, because uh, the, the patent is still in force today. Nobody's challenged it. They've not prosecuted anybody for it. And it's almost expired. Uh, so it's kind of irrelevant. Um, I, I think there's other areas to go after in terms of, you know, we're yeah. – we, we, we we're, we're suppressing generic drugs, right? That's a real problem. Uh, that the only thing the politicians seem to speak about are the vaccines when there are all these other repurposed drugs that might actually solve this problem for a 10th of the price, but you can't talk about them on social media platforms, right? That, that's so I was just talking about David Martin's claim. Like, uh, of course, it's, it's great to have your insights on the patent side of things, but he also claimed that SARS-CoV-2 is not a novel virus. And that's, that's untrue according to oh, you. Right? Well, uh, you know, that's an area I may agree with him in that I, I don't, uh, I'm not convinced this, this is zoonotic, um, that okay. there does seem to be some different codon structures in the, in the furin cleavage site than you see in the rest of the virus. And if you look at the codon usage on the part of the virus that matches pangolin versus the part that matches rat G13, it's different. So someone fused together three pieces of a, of a virus, and I'm very suspect that that happened in the wild just because we don't see that, that level of recombination with coronaviruses right now. So... I, you know, it's probably out of Wuhan. It's probably been made in a lab, but it was probably cut and pasted from viruses that our population has seen before. So I'm, I'm not as worried of it being a bioweapon because I think we already have immunity to these ancestors. Someone shuffled the ancestors around, but our immune systems are smart enough to sort a lot of that out. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's probably there's more work that needs to be done, I think, looking into who funded that and and the, you know, looks like it came out of Fauci and, and through Echo Health Alliance, and, and that, that definitely needs to be uh, for, furtherly scrutinized. Great, Kevin, man. Thank you so much. You've given us a lot of your time, man. I just want to wrap up with uh, your views on Bitcoin and, like, uh, anarchy and stuff, because I know that you're, you're kind of libertarian, if I'm not mistaken, from, and I, I mean, I come from the same, like, kind of anarcho-capitalist, uh, you know, school of thought with Rothbard and other people. So oh, excellent. Maybe, yeah, maybe if you could just, like, uh, like share your final thoughts on the peer review process, because I, I think you have some critiques about that well, and like how, how Bitcoin can help in this whole crisis. Yeah, so so peer review, I think, really needs to be peer to peer. We've got to disintermediate the third party that's you know elbowing their way into this and taking all the money out of the process. I mean, when, when you when you go through a peer review process, you usually give the journal three to five grand to manage the peer review process, and you know, it covers some of their typesetting fees and the editing. And I, I don't, I, I those are valuable services that people provide but they don't necessarily need to be provided in, in the way that journals are providing them. I think the challenge we have with journals is that on top of this, they have an advertisement revenue and oftentimes their advertisement revenue can be in conflict with what the paper is presenting. Um, so we've seen a lot of suppression of, of papers that suggest there might be harm in vaccines and the vaccine companies are strong advertisers in a lot of the journals. 
for what's going on there. We saw with the Corman Drosten paper, the, the authors on that paper were on the editorial part of the journal that they got the paper through in 24 hours, and they all had businesses that were going to benefit from PCR detection, right? Those conflicts never got brought to the table until after this went through. So I think with Bitcoin, you can do things where you can incentivize a peer-to-peer -peer network, almost like Uber drivers. Granted, the, we'd rather have the PhDs that are running around the country doing peer review than doing Uber driving. Some of them are doing Uber driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but you could put bounties out there and the bounty doesn't have to be this fixed price of three to five grand. I mean, it's it's really ludicrous to me that it's the same price to peer review a hundred page paper versus a three page paper. You could have a hundred authors on one and three on the other, right? I mean, there's, there's the magnitude of work is so immense. There can't be a one size fits all review process for this, but that, that's what we have. And I think it's because there's no pricing signal in review. If we had a pricing signal where the, the fee could fluctuate based on the amount of work, you could have, you know, platinum level review, gold level review, silver, bronze level reviews, and you could crowdsource these people from all over the world with cryptocurrencies. And as long as it was all transparently done, that all communication was put public and hashed onto blockchains, um, you would have a perfect audit trail of the review process. And then the internet could weigh in on, okay, these reviewers look like they're bought off or they're they have conflicts that they didn't disclose and we don't trust them. And, uh, you know, these ones, oh, you're, it looks like you're giving them too much money. Uh, you're bribing them kind of thing. But I think when when all the money gets put on the table and you can see who's getting what, um, it, ex it exposes a lot of what's going on. I, I think right now people are demanding all of the people do the peer reviews for free. The journals take all the money and they get the advertisement money to further conflict their 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 position in this role. Mm. But I think that money should be going to the people actually commit, who, who are providing the most quality, which are the reviewers themselves. And everyone's like, oh, that's bribery. You can't do it. But so what, what are the incentives for someone to review a paper right now? Like for you to none, review a paper? None. Just, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a right? The okay. only people that review papers are people who want to go read their competitor stuff before it publishes. Mm -hmm. And they're usually throwing sand and grenades into your review process. Uh, so th there's, um, you know, some people claim they do it just to stay involved and, and, and networked. But... Um, there's not a lot of uh, reason for people to spend a lot of time on them, so they end up doing them very hastily. I think if you if you built a market like this, people might decide to spend half a year of their time becoming you know making money, being a reviewer, and being and getting a very good reputation score for doing it, and they'd be highly sought out after to review other papers or debunk other papers. Uh, you'd build a market and a reputation system for people who are really good at this. Uh, and I think that would bid up their price as a reviewer in certain market in, in certain markets. Um, so I really like market forces. I think we need market forces in there. I think it needs to be peer to peer. We need to disintermediate the third party that has conflicts. Uh, and yes, this does mean we're going to be paying reviewers. But frankly, if they're talented at what they do, you should value their time and you should pay them for it. As long as that payment is made clear and they have no other conflicts involved in the work, the world gets to know you got paid. And you'll have to own up to the fact that you gave that review for whatever, $3,000, and uh, you gotta, you'll have to be comfortable with that. At the very, I mean, just as an analogy, Stephen Buston was giving his expert testimony for the Wakefield trial, and he was paid yeah, yeah. 20,000 pounds for that. It's a half a million dollars. So it's cool for someone to, to review work as long as they're getting paid half a million dollars, but you can't get paid a damn cent if they were the reviewer on the original Wakefield paper. Since that, since you touched on Wakefield, I just I just want to bring this up. This up. So Stephen Bustin, the you know the guy we spoke about earlier, who actually was I think part, he he claimed on a podcast that he was part of the paper that critiqued like your rebuttal to the Common Rawson paper, right? Yes. Yeah. So he was involved in the Andrew Wakefield case like early on, where I think a couple of parents were trying to show that uh, after getting the MMR vaccine, there's some measles virus in the GI tract or something, yes. something like that. And that time Stephen Bustin had really criticized. Uh, Andrew Wakefield for the way he did his PCR protocol. He, and, he uh, levied yeah. the exact same critiques against Wakefield as we put in the Corman Drossen paper. Yeah, yeah. The, I see. I see this process. a lot. I see this a lot. Wherever like testing can be used to take away uh, liberties, like they they just leave out all the uh, uncertainties. And we see yeah. this clearly with Boston right now. Like I mean, the testing is being used to basically like house arrest everyone and take all our like civil rights away. And you know, he's basically like overlooked all the critiques he's had up till now. And right. you know, at that point, when the Wakefield's case probably threatened the vaccine program, he was like really at it with, you know, all the yep. critiques that he had. He beat him up for no internal controls. He had mismatches in the primers. He didn't have a strong SOP that clarified what CT was was infectious. I mean, this, these are the exact same arguments we levied against Drosten. He had against 
Wakefield. And he even claimed like in writing in testimony that if you were on the other side of the table, you come to the same conclusion. So don't worry about his half a million dollars <laughs> incentivization in it. And then here we are on the other side of the table and he's, 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 he's not having any, any part of it. So, and it's surprising. I think, I think you haven't heard it, but you should go and listen to Boston's podcast with David Crow. David Crow is actually one of these people who come from uh, more of the Stefan Lanka and, uh, you know, uh, the Peter Duesberg side of things where they claim okay. that viruses don't exist and stuff. So he was actually on with David Crow before David Crow expired. And he really went into great detail with all the problems. I think it was just that it, it wasn't like practically relevant at that point. So he didn't, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, read, I haven't heard that one. That'll be really interesting to hear because, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's got great work and all the Mikey guidelines that like all that stuff is, is yeah. dead on. I just think he's selectively deploying those guidelines to whatever suits his, his benefit right now. I mean, he's yeah, one, one thing that the Euro surveillance should have done is they should have known that Stephen had a QPCR company that he's trying to get funded for, for C19 PCR. So to pick him as a reviewer for our paper, knowing he does not want to downgrade or, or, or say anything negative about the validity of QPCR because he's about to start a company that relies on it. I mean, that was a conflict out of the gate that Euro surveillance should have known enough to you know, it seems to us that they they never put their the reviews public. By the way, I mean, only Stephen offered his comments in that podcast. We've still not even seen. They claim they had five reviewers for the Corman Drossen review. We've never seen a single review from any of them, and the one that has come out clearly had conflicts they didn't screen. So it looks to us like they just did a. This was just a you know investigate themselves paperwork and put it behind us type of job, but. Um, but that you know that's an example where peer review is a little bit frightening because Euro surveillance is actually state it's like a state sponsored journal. Mm. So all you need for a state to like change the Gutenberg printing press and, and change religion uh, is to start funding journals and funding scientists and you create all of this fiat science yeah. uh, and you can drive a whole political narrative that reduces liberties and gives the government more more control. So that's why I'm really adamant. I think I think we've got to get blockchains involved in the scientific process and in the publication process because I think it's the only way we're going to bring trust back to the system after surges fear and all these other blowups we've had during coronavirus. Yeah, I mean, I, that is fascinating for me to like come across you and you know hear your views on that because there's very few people talking about like you know like an intermesh between like what the scientific um, aspects of the medical side of things and like you know integrating Bitcoin and, and things like that and I. I see the kind of same corruption also with the way tests are used right now. Like, as I was saying, when tests can be used to give people freedom, they talk about all the uncertainties, like with antibody testing, you know, they right. test like antibody levels weigh in and like there's all these issues with antibody testing, but PCR has like a hundred issues, but no worries. Like you can just put the CT cycles high and have all these issues. It's not a problem, but we shouldn't even miss out on one positive case. And that's, yeah. I think, a larger problem with the state controlling the entire pandemic response. I don't even think the state should exist because I come like, on the full like other right. side of the spectrum. Yeah. But even if we believe in minimum government, I don't think they're supposed to be involved in, uh, you know, restricting people's uh, movement. You know, based on a virus, wherein it's not just about the attack vector. It's also about like what we can do personally to make sure that we don't succumb from it. So it's not just like I'm a threat to you, but you also have personal responsibility. So I think it just right. comes down to like decentralized individual decisions wherein if people are okay with accepting the risk of going out and contracting it, like they should be allowed to go out. Like who's the state to come and shut them down? Well, right? it, it reeks of central planning when you try to central yeah. plan the human immune system like this. You know, we've got yeah. all of them chasing one solution to this, which is a spike only vaccine, right? Uh, that's, that's, that's really fragile design. A virus can easily find a way around that. But if you let every jurisdiction experiment with some with hydroxychloroquine, some with ivermectin, some with, you know, multiple different vaccines, that's a harder thing for a virus to deal with. Um, but we seem to have this when we're afraid, we reinforce central planning in the state. Yeah. And that is the worst possible recipe for dealing with a virus that's decentralizing across the globe. So since you brought up the variants, do you think that, uh, I mean, if, I, if I've contracted natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2, uh, I've heard many arguments that, you know, the T-cells can, you know, basically pick up different variants and there's, there's arguments about like SARS T-cells recognizing SARS-CoV-2 18 years later. So do you think that's a, something people should be concerned about with the variants that, that have been hyped up right now? If someone has natural immunity, I'm not talking about someone just got like vaccine yeah, immunity. The, the natural immunity, I think it's going to be durable and you'll have enough epitopes there to deal with all the variants um, that, that occur. Because they're even seeing cross-reactivity with these things with old yeah, viruses. Yeah. They're far more distant. So 
Um, yes, it'll in in a few years it may evolve to be get slightly nastier like flu does, um, but I don't think it's going to be. I, th I think you'll see the the vast majority of the pandemic wane once everyone has twenty nine kb full immunity, and that's probably not going to happen until the vaccinated cohort suddenly all gets it again. We're going to need enough breakthrough on the vaccinated cohorts to eventually give them full immunity, and of course the unvaccinated eventually getting it and perhaps being being uh, treated with it, but. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that, I mean, some of the seropositivity data we've been seeing in some jurisdictions are as high as like 40 or 50 percent, meaning that, that there's that many people have naturally acquired it. That's really hopeful that we, we're, we're almost there. You know, we get out to maybe 60 or 70 percent with some of the vaccinated folks getting partial. They, they're, they're totally ignoring that, right? Like what they're saying is that oh, uh, ignore, immunity yeah. uh, is, is fine, but like if you vaccinate on top of that, you get better immunity. Yeah, and, there's no evidence for that. <laughs> Yeah. They're, I mean, they're making those claims based on chasing a couple antibodies, but antibodies yeah. are ephemeral. I mean, your, your immune system is not going to be permanently expressing antibodies. The whole point of those antibodies is to slow things down, and they have T cells that are, are what get rebooted, and B cells that get rebooted when you see it again. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the focus on, on the antibody levels is a real shame because you don't always know if they're neutralizing antibodies. Um, and this whole ADE thing, it, it relies on the opposite effect, which is you get antibodies that bind to the spike protein that help facilitate its, its, uh, mm. uh, its entry into the cell. So I think the antibody, they really need to be doing everything with T cell sequencing because uh, that's the only thing that tells you whether you have long-term durable immunity. But I, I mean, it's so too how, expensive. How would we go about, uh, yeah, how would we go about measuring immunity if, if let's say like governments were to accept that we can determine if you have immunity and let you go, like not a vaccine certificate, but actual like determination of immunity. Like what, what would you test for other than antibodies to, to figure that out? Uh, the, there's TCR sequencing that people do now. There's a company called T-Direct that does this. I think it's about $150, but you need a blood draw. So that's a little bit of a, a downer on it. Um, but that measures, it sequences across the T-cell receptors. Okay. And that shows you your, your whole immune profile of what you've seen before. Um, very helpful because you can see they, they, they presumably can find a, a correlations in that data of a lot of other immuno history that's going on. Um, but they can tell if you've, if you've seen it because, and, and that's important because as you know, the T cells are still present from the 1918 flu. They're still present from the SARS CoV-1 18 years later. Um, so the antibodies are all gone after a year probably. So you, yeah. the only thing you're going to be able to gauge now that we're at least a year into this and everybody is, is T cell sequencing is going to be the most complete way to know whether someone's had it before. Or, yeah, and uh, just a final thing, we use a, uh, the rapid antigen test a lot in our country, actually. Uh, so, and uh, earlier in the podcast, you said that, uh, you know, if you're not using PCR, like RAT is at least better than the PCR because you at least you have a higher chance of picking out infectious virus. But uh, what what we've seen practically out here is that, you know, you can use RAT much more frequently. So, yeah. it, uh, and I mean, I've seen papers where they've tried to correlate RAT with the culture test. And they still found false positives. Like it's it's not a you know complete match. Like yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They still have a like mismatch with how many RAT uh, samples are positive and uh, like how many things they can culture. Do you have any insights on that? Well, I do like the fact that you can run them multiple times. They're cheaper mm -hmm. and they're faster. Um, but yeah, Michael Mino also commented they are tend to be a little bit less sensitive than PCR. Yeah. Um, and so you might, but still, you might still not be, perfect, right? Like still, yeah. Not, there might be yeah, some yeah. false negatives. Um, I didn't, I didn't know there were false positives on there. Oh yeah, I'll send you the papers on that. I actually yeah, yeah. I'd love to read those just to see what yeah. what, what level they have there because uh, there has been a, a, a bit of a mud fight between the PCR scientists mm -hmm. and the rat test because they're they're competing for the same space. But um, I, I, don't I think know. it certainly is better than the PCR, but because you can test it so frequently. Right. Even if it, if it has a lower rate of false positives, because you do it so much more, you will have like more actual false positives than doing PCR because PCR takes 20 hours to come around. Oh, yeah, right. and, and like right now, we're, um, they, they've implemented all of these rules here about you need to be vaccinated or PCR positive to do anything. Yeah, to a concert yeah. same here, same here, man. It's so same we, we, can't, we can't even get, I've been, I just got back from traveling from Denver and tried to sign up for a test and I couldn't, I got back on Sunday, we can't get one until Thursday. So, I mean, I don't know what the point is. If I'm five days into this, why test? <laughs> yeah. I, I should be sick by now, right? <laughs> so I've um, the rat test, that's what a, a really attracts me to them is you could do them at home. You could decentralize this. You could people test until, oh, look, I don't have any signal today. Or if I do, wait another day, do it again, do it again, do it again until it's negative. Um, yeah. You don't have this uh, centralized laboratory process where you've got to wait until the test is available. And then when you take the test, you got a couple more days before you get an answer. That that just is um, unfortunate. So I, I 
I, I'm attracted to them because now they could put PCR at home. There are tests that can do these PCR like things in the home setting, but the FDA is just not letting them out the door. Um, they're, they're using some lamp assays and some CRISPR assays. There's a, there's a variety of ways to do it. Um, and that, that they would probably overcall people would be my concern that you still pick up the virus five weeks after you've had it. But uh, some of them are semi-quantitative. So you could look at how, you know, if your load's going up or down and get a better bearing, maybe combine it with a rat test and know, okay, I'm safe to go back to work now. But um, and unfortunately, a lot of their their grip on this is forcing the testing into centralized laboratories. And then we don't have full transparency in how those things are run. And then those, those reports get sent to government databases. There's not full transparency in how they run those databases. I've seen some jurisdictions in Spain where they think there's, there's, there's always an elevated um, positivity rate compared to the data that they independently audit at the labs and they don't know who's doing that. Right. So there's all types of risks when we centralize this stuff when it comes to, yeah. And, and the labs are big snitches as well. Like whenever you go test with them, they'll report it to the government. And then if you're positive, like local municipal, you people will actually yeah. Come. Yeah. <laughs> we've had that happen here. Like, I hope you'll be quarantining. I'm like, who gave you our medical information? <laughs> Yeah, so certainly home test is better at least because you can keep your data private. Like if you're actually testing positive, you can just shut up and not, not let anyone know. Yeah, like, yeah, quarantine on your own. It's no one else's business. You don't have to get a scarlet letter everywhere you walk around in town. Yeah, yeah. Okay, man, that's that's great. Thank you so much for giving us so much of your yeah, time. Yeah, it was a great really talk. Anytime, yeah. time, Johan. I'd love to uh, do it again sometime in the future. It's great yeah, to hear what's going on on the other side of the world. Thank you. Any, any final thoughts before we close? No, I, I, uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter. I'm Kevin underscore McKernan. Yeah. And um, if you're interested in any cannabis uh, genomics, we do that as a, that's, that's our, our, our job in the other field is we're trying to build a decentralized uh, kind of Linux operating system of pharmaceuticals, finding drugs that are widely available that you can grow out of the ground that aren't in, uh, you know, trapped up in these patent estates and, and uh, this FDA complications. So um, th there's a lot of work there on open source genomics that we do for, um, for the cannabis space. Thank you so much, Kevin. Pleasure to have you. All right. Thank you. Bye. See you, man. Cheers.